Ready to go? Present mode. Present mode engaged. Hey, Steve, how's it going? Not bad, Ben, yourself? Yeah, not bad. Hey, um, so I felt really bad uh, last year that I uh, went over to Germany without you. Um, I know. I was, I was so disappointed that I didn't get to go. Yeah, it sucked. It re- it was really upsetting. So anyway, um, we're in a we're in a little bit of a situation now. Um, and I sort of figured uh, if I can't go to Germany, and you didn't go to Germany last year, then why don't we just both pretend we're in Germany right now and and do a presentation? But if only we had German beer right now. I mean, okay. Well, I don't have German beer. I I only had have the, sparkling water. <laughs> I had the opportunity, but I didn't. Uh, I didn't. I didn't uh, think that well in advance. Anyway, let's 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 jump right in because hey, we're doing a presentation. Welcome to PSConf uh, 2020. That's what this is. Yeah, that's what this is. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. PSConf 2020. Apparently, we're still in 2020. Um, yeah, it's like 2030 <laughs> right now with all the lockdowns and stuff. Exactly. It's it's horrifying. Um. All right. So look, we're gonna go. Uh, we're just gonna go straight into it. Um. This is one of the two presentations uh, I was going to present. This one is just around automated application testing. Um, so yep. let's, let's go into this. There's quite a lot that we need to sort of undo, and I promise this isn't clickbait, but a lot of the things I've said in the title uh, I can't use. So it's uh, automated application testing, how to make Azure Spot VMs and DevOps pipelines do the work for you with myself yep. and obviously Steve, yes. my good friend. Uh, come on, man. <laughs> uh, all right. So the big so, caveat sorry. here, yeah. So, so what, what's the false advertising here, Ben? What, what aren't we going to get? The false advertising why? is that I cannot make Azure Spot VMs do the work for me, because uh, Azure Spot VMs require a very specific license uh, or, or uh, what's the term, subscription type uh, to to actually run. And that very very important license is one that you pay real money for. Ah, okay. So my MSDN uh, account that I get my free two hundred dollar funny money every month, it doesn't count. So I spent I spent a couple of weeks trying to get the Spot VM stuff uh, to work, only to realize eventually uh, that that didn't work. I then reached out to a couple of people, including yourself, uh, where you're just like, yeah, I've got like tens of thousands of dollars in funny money. Just use this tenant. It still doesn't work because if you didn't pay for it, you don't get access to this. Um, but yeah, we can we can talk about that a little bit. Um, but the key, the, the reason that I wanted to use Spot VMs was that this is sort of the perfect use case for it, because the uh, the idea of what we're doing is we're rapidly building virtual machines for a very short amount of time to put some code on there to run it to make sure it runs how we want in a sanitized way, and then we can report whether it was true or false, and then just get rid of the virtual machine. So a Spot VM costs fractions of a cent per hour it's it's ridiculously small it's very volatile it may drop out at, at the drop of the hat but the cost savings outweigh any real negatives to it so that's why i really wanted to give it a go um that well, makes sense and, and and it's a really awesome use case for the azure spot vms that look i'm betting wasn't an original use case for the design exactly it wasn't yeah but and and not to sort of harp on this any longer but the difference between configuring a spot VM and configuring a normal VM is one click of the mouse button. If we're talking GUI world, um, all you're doing is you're configuring the virtual machine exactly as you normally would. Um, but at, at the start, you're just saying, I would like to make this a spot VM instance. That's it. Um, so yeah, awesome. let's move on to slide two. Ooh, slide two. Our very hey, we're going to talk about sponsors. sponsors. So obviously we've got quite a few sponsors here. Microsoft, what a shock. Uh, System Frontier. Cool. Script Runner and PowerShell One. Um, obviously, sponsors make this uh, this conference what it is. So thank you very much for helping out. Um, again, it's a real shame that we're not all in the same room, but we'll just have to get on. Exactly. Okay. So let's uh, let's get into the agenda. Um, there's not a lot of slides, I promise. This is all very heavily demo centric. Um, so we'll just we'll just get through it. Um, so first, we're going to talk about what's new in application deployment for Intune. Um, we sort of, I had a discussion with Steve about this before we hit record and he's just like, nothing. Um, <laughs> there's a couple of things. There is a couple of things this time, last, since this time last year, there's been some That's changes right. uh, for the better. So we'll, we'll just go, we'll quickly touch on those just so that we're 
sort of all up to date on uh, on that. It just felt like all of those components came in like two years ago, not like exactly. Months yeah, ago. Look, time doesn't really mean anything anymore, so <laughs> I understand. Um, so secondly, we're going to recap um, the sort of the state of how you. Uh, get an application ready for deployment in Intune right now. Um, not doing any uh, fancy um, programmatic deployments or just literally just going through and just building an application and getting it ready for deployment. Yep. Um, then we're going to start talking about testing and Ooh, why testing. it's really important uh, in, in application deployment. So I, yeah, I want to... Testing production. Yes, yes, we should all test in production. No, <laughs> what I want to do is I want to just change the conversation around application packaging and and sort of frame it in the idea of we're actually developing a solution here so we need to we need to actually test the solution before we push it out um there's you know this could be its own session this could be a breakout thing that we talk about in the live uh, q a three four sessions it could, yeah there's, there's a lot of conversation around this and look in in reality um the application packaging world is very very small um, yes. People don't really think about it until they absolutely have to. I'm one of those people that uh, I, I guess I hate myself because I really enjoy application packaging and the cool complexity. Freak. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a freak. I yeah, I don't know, I don't know. I just I I enjoy it. So we're going to talk a little bit about testing and why I think um, that gets uh, not really looked at uh, in in this scope. Yeah. Um, and then we're going to look at using DevOps to do a lot of that testing and the boring stuff for us, so that we can move on to other things. Definitely. Cool. And and also, let's just not call it boring. It's the less repetitive things. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. If you can automate it, if you know how to do it reliably, yes, let's automate it. And that's the key thing. Um, all right. So, reliability. Exactly. Uh, all right. So what's new in application deployment for Intune? As Steve lovingly told me earlier, nothing. <laughs> um, so it's a small list, but it is a very important list. Yeah. Um, and what this is actually, a lot of these, um, a lot of the changes or additions to Intune are actually getting it closer to parity to Config Manager, um, yes. which is only a good thing. Um, so the first thing is that we now have uh, device restart behavior control. Um, what that means is that we can go in and we can uh, choose what the device is going to do based on the exit code of the of the software. So we can suppress a reboot, uh, we can force a reboot regardless of exit code, um, or we can you know set up a, a a prompt to the end user just advising that hey a reboot's been uh, flagged. There's a fairly high chance that your device is going to drop out. Um, no. In reality, I have never seen if if you set up an application to uh, to install and, and you don't suppress the reboot, this device restart behavior, unless you've specifically stated suppress, it's going to drop your machine without yes. warning. Um, so I, I, I do think it needs a little bit of uh, finesse, um, but it is there. It is a function that we, we now have. Yep. Um, dependencies, this is a big one. Um, and it seems like it's been there for, for years, but it actually has been less than 12 months. Um, yep. So dependencies allow us to chain application installs. So if you have an application that requires Office and you're not using the standard uh, 0365 uh, package, you've, you've got your own thing, then well, you can here, say- here's, here's the thing though, with the dependencies, you can't say you're dependent upon um, the default Microsoft uh, Office drop-down modes. Microsoft 365 App Center now, so oh. as an option, you can't actually make it dependent. So That's dependencies correct. are only Win32 apps. That's yeah. So that's that's sort of what I was getting at, Steve. It, it, the the clarification here is that you can now make Win32 app dependencies and only Win32 app. So if you've got a sure. line of business application or a store for business app or anything like that, um, that's not in the purview of what these dependencies are. This is just its own little ecosystem of of applications that you've packaged. So. Yep. In theory, gone are the days of uh, like a really complex install string wrapper um, that you know that chains together multiple installs. What you can do now is you can just say you know this application can only install if A, B, and C are already installed. Um, yeah. You can do really it complex works. chaining, yeah. but the it trick is yeah. yeah. So the trick is Steve, if you do very complex chaining. Uh, it's very difficult to track down which application is chaining. So if you've gone, if you've got application one 
and then application two has got a dependency on application one, and then application three has a dependency on application two. If you try to delete three, it doesn't tell you that two is the dependency or that if, you know, things up the line are chained and it gets very messy. I've, I've had a client that uh, decided to get tricky with this stuff and it took me a couple of hours to try and undo the, the mess that was his that's, dependency chains. But that's what dependency mapper is for, right? Yeah, it doesn't work that well. Okay, cool. It's getting there. I, I haven't so, tested it. Exactly. Um, so, the other thing, though, regarding uh, when we sit there and say it's only been 32 dependencies, yep. we do have another functionality in the platform, which is under requirements, you can now do custom requirements for files, registries, or scripts. So yeah. you can sit there and make sure that if you're installing an Outlook plugin or a VPN client and you require uh, drivers to be installed or Office to be installed first, you can check for certain key files to exist on the computer. I might just bring that up really quickly as well so we can have a look at the environment. Um, so, all right, we'll, we'll go through all of these things. We'll just, we'll just sort of step through the other new things that are available to us as well. Um, yeah. And then we'll just go in and have a look at all the new things. Um, cool, so we've got assignment controls now. Um, so assignment controls literally mean that we now get to control uh, how the deployment uh, is affected by the, the the deployment assignments or the groups. So what the, what that means is that we can suppress the the prompts that the application needs to be installed, um, and we can also schedule uh, the deployment. So we've got an actual time based schedule. So it's yep. again it's getting back it's to awesome. It is it really is because it means you can prepare the deployment, um, and you don't have to do it exactly when it needs to go out, which is great. Yep. Um, and the suppression of the prompts is fantastic as well because if you need to do a quick fix because you've uh, stuffed something up, the engine is going to see That's it. because you didn't test it before you deployed it back. Exactly, exactly. And if only we had some kind of testing mechanism in place. Exactly. Um, and so finally, we have the new management portal. Um, yeah. This is a big one for uh, all of Intune, not specifically just application packaging um, but it is it's it's so important um, that we really need to talk about it because yes. it changes the locations of some of the uh, configuration policies and stuff in Intune um, it doesn't affect application packaging um, but it's really important because the original original the new original Intune portal uh, is going to be end of life very soon the Azure Intune portal the Azure Engine uh, Portal. That's oh, sorry, right. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Ibiza, Ibiza. It's all Ibi about Ibiza. Okay. Ibiza. All right. Because um, that was the code name for the portal. But okay. Uh, so August first is when that all goes um, and cuts. You have to cut across into the new uh, Endpoint Manager portal. Yeah, right. Um, so if you go into portal.azure.com today, Ben, and you'll see in, in the Azure. Uh, in the Intune blade, when you go to that, it'll actually have a banner across the top stating. Um, if you go to Intune, it will now have a little bar along the top in blue. On, on August, August 1st, 2020, the current Intune Azure portal experience will be retired when moving to yep. our new home in the Microsoft Endpoint Management. There yep. you go. So August, August 1st. Um, yep. If I so can, yeah. there's an AKA address for it as well. So aka.ms uh, slash DMAC. Because it was Device Management Admin Center. Oh, uh, what? And then it just routes you through? Yeah, because it's the same portal. Okay, but it's still coming out with Device Management. Anyway, the correct URL yeah. is endpoint.microsoft.com. So this is the new uh, this is the new uh, portal for Intune management uh, or modern modern device management, um, and so the, the couple of the key things and I won't get too much into this because it sort of does fall outside of uh, the presentation, um, but things like uh, device configuration policies um, now exist within devices and configuration policies. And you can policies. break it down via platform as well. Exactly. Yeah. Nice. So it's it is previously a, we couldn't do that. Yeah, it is a better portal. Um, previously, it was missing some of the functionality, so I just basically needed to use both 
Um, but yep. now it is fully parity and it has more features now than the original uh, portal in, in the Azure portal. So, so start it's better using than original Coke. It is, exactly. It cool. is new Coke. It is awesome. So let's go in. We'll just create a uh, Win32 app. Um, I just wanted to show everyone if I've got, uh, I'm pretty sure I do, C drive in. Test. Sure, this will work. Um, I'm not going to put anything else in. We'll just leave it as so, basic. Uh, important thing to understand as well is when you put a logo there, that's for what you're going to see in company portal. So if you're going to make an application available to an end user, make sure you put a logo there. Exactly. It looks yeah. pretty. It's simple. You, all you have to do is go to their website and do a screen grab and you've got a PNG file and you can upload it. Just do it. All right, so we're not actually doing this. I just want to get to the, the fun stuff. Um, so yep. this is the device restart behavior. Um, so we've got determined behavior based on return codes, no specific action. App install may force a device restart or Intune will force a mandatory device restart. So obviously you can set that and regardless <laughs> of the state of the application, it's going to force a restart on your machine and God help you if you, uh, if you do that, don't do that. <laughs> don't be, don't be the person who uses this. Um, no specific uh, if, action. If you do force a mandatory device restart, make sure you have notifications popping up. Exactly. Um, Cause otherwise it will just randomly restart a computer. It will uh, make sure you go out to lunch after you deploy it is what I'm suggesting. Maybe don't come back. Um, yeah. But honestly, the two Thanks the two most important weekend. ones here are determined behavior based on return codes and no specific action. As a rule of thumb, I generally sit on no specific action, and then I make sure that the the application and own packaging. Um, I first of all, I understand whether the application requires a reboot or not, and then I figured out a way that I can through business uh, comms uh, figure out a way to reboot that on a schedule, if yeah. if it absolutely needs to happen. Um, so obviously we've got return codes. There's nothing new there. Um, requirements is the one that Steve uh, mentioned. So obviously we've got our operating system architecture, all and this we're stuff. we're all still doing x86. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It should just be 64, right? Minimal operating yep. system, always 1903. Um, but the new stuff that we've got here is the uh, additional requirement rules. Yep. Um, and this is very similar to the detection rule stuff where we've now got the ability to do file, registry, or script. Um, so, you know, we can we can uh, say that the application can only be installed if a specific file is on the machine. Likewise, registry script is the more customized one where we've got a script that will do our you know our deeper dives probably probably into like sim instances or things like that um, yeah. that we, that we really need to pull out because the application's got a terrible installer or something or like you, that. Or, or you need to process something on the device and can transform it into a usable function. Exactly. Exactly. Um, one of the key things that I will point out, um, and surprisingly, I haven't actually used this functionality yet, um, but the enforce uh, script signature check. Now, if you set that to yes, what that means is that your script needs to be signed. Yes. This is important because if you say no, which is by default, what in theory is supposed to happen is that the script will pop up on the end user's machine and say, hey, something needs to run, do you approve it, right? It runs the script with end user confirmation. Now, I've heard from people that that doesn't happen. I've yet to test it, but it is I've something- not that, done it. I've not tested it either. Yeah, so it needs to be called out that it's a great functionality, um, but unless you're signing your scripts, uh, it may not work for you. And obviously script signing is very important. It's not something that I do at the moment, but you know, it is in your production environment. You should probably have some kind of code signing uh, yes. function um, that does all that stuff for you. And it, and it makes sense. Um, and we've got output data trap. We can do Boolean. That's actually really cool. This is this is now better yeah. than Config Manager. Um, because no, we Config can, Manager has the same stuff. Does it? Yeah. Not in detection method then. Uh, uh, yeah, in detection method, it's very much like that. It's always been true or nothing. Oh, wait. Oh, that's no. No, Nothing sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of DCMs. Yeah, 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 exactly. Um, okay, so now we're into detection rules. So there's nothing different here. We've got manually configured detection rules, which are just 
you know, exactly the same as we just looked at MSI file Except registry. MSI instead of a script there. Uh, no, so, okay. So we've got MSI file and registry, which are our basic ones. Yes. But then if we want to do a complex one, we do use That's a custom right. detection script and then it's the same exactly. thing. And it's got the same warning here as well as enforce script signature check. So again, if you say no, in theory, this is going to pop up and it's going to ask for uh, confirmation. Now, I don't know whether that's going to pop up in the company portal or not. I've just, I've never needed to do it, uh, which is surprising. Um, I in, in previous lives, I very much have had complex uh, PowerShell detection methods in Config Manager. I just haven't needed it in Intune. So yeah. I just haven't done it. Um, all right, so let's just. I think that comes down to the fact that um, a lot of the stuff that we're doing via Intune has become a lot simpler. Um, where we're doing single file installers and we're not changing versions of Office or something like that. Yeah, I think that's uh, I think that's totally fair to say. Uh, so dependencies is where we uh, what we we're talking about before. So we can chain up to a maximum of 100 dependencies, uh, which include the dependencies of any included dependency. So if you're nesting, uh, if you're your nesting 100 dependencies, <laughs> you need to rethink how you're deploying your applications. Um, it's not a task sequence, people. <laughs> it's not a task sequence. Yeah. It, it, it can be, don't do it, bad. Um, so yeah, so maximum of 100 dependencies. I, I'd very much, if, anyone, if anyone's got an application that requires 100 prereqs, please sing out. I'd love to hear, um, but the this is where you do The largest one I've done was 26. That's crazy. Executables and installers. So yeah, obviously you just go in here and you just select your applications that you've pre-packaged and that sort of stuff. It's, it's yep. pretty self-explanatory. Um, and then finally, we've got assignments. So the new stuff that we've got here, um, we'll just go into available. Um, and this, I think this is probably one of the important things that was changed um, recently, which is the interface here. Yes. So previously on the previous interface, you had a drop down and you'd say, I want to add a group and you'd hit the drop down and it would change it. You wouldn't be able to select group and it, yeah. it was not intuitive. No, Whereas this is much this better. Here is a lot easier to use. Um, one thing that you'll note is now that Ben's added the Intune baseline, you can now click on the install mode and it'll bring up a blade on the right hand side and you can change it to exclude. Yeah, so this is where we now get all that functionality that we were talking about the new stuff. So obviously we can now select include or excluded. Um, and then we've got the end user notification patrol. So show everything, show uh, toast notifications for computer restarts or hide all toast notifications, don't show the user that something's happening. Um, so if you hit hide all toast notifications and then do a mandatory restart. <laughs> that's where you lose your job, exactly. You are um, going to restart the executive's computers while they're presenting. That's it. On a um, Teams call at home. <laughs> it can't be stressed enough, do not do this. Um, delivery optimization priority, this is new. Uh, this is like new, new. Um, I so seen that before. Exactly. So regardless of whether of how you've got your DO policies set up, this is where you get to control whether the content downloads in foreground or background. Now, if you've got your DO set up to uh, limit download, uh, pro, uh, so background download processes, then this app's going to get affected by that. However, if you don't have anything set for foreground and you need your app to be super, super like it needs to be installed uh, and you, you know, it's like, damn the rules. I just need it down as fast as possible. That's where you select content downloaded in foreground. So this is actually really cool. Um, yep. And it's going to get you around a lot of the autopilot deployment issues that you have if you set up DO. Yes. Yes. So this is really good. And again, this is like so new. I haven't even used this in a deployment yet. Um, so this is, this is great. This is really good. Um, yep. Finally, we've got app availability. So this is the scheduling that we were talking about. So by default, it's as soon as possible. Um, alternatively, we can do a specific date and time um, and it's just date, time, and then we can either do UTC or device time zone. So it's pretty pretty simple stuff. Cool. Okay, so that's that's going through all the new stuff in in the uh, the app packaging world. Um, hope, hope that was exciting. Of Intune. Of Intune, exactly. So the, the important thing to note right now is this was after build so the announcement around the new uh microsoft windows app management or app package win get there you go um has been made 
We haven't tested that, or I haven't tested. I doubt Ben has. No, I haven't. Because he's it's been actually, super stressed about getting this organized. I have. Um, that actually does segue into a good conversation that I wanted to have. This this presentation might end up going for four hours. Um, <laughs> last year, after the presentation that I did around application deployment, I had a bunch of people come up to me saying, Ben, that was really cool, but why didn't you just use Chocolatey? Or why didn't you use Enter Package Management Name? And I sort of sat there and I was like, yeah, I, I understand what you're saying. Um, let me formulate an answer to that. So I have one. Package managers that are non-standard, such as Chocolatey, let's even call Winget a non-standard package manager because yep. right now it doesn't come so with Windows, so it's non-standard. Sure. Um, name your poison, any package manager you want to think of. That manages the package. How do you get the package or how do you kick off the request to get that package installed on your machine? You still need a delivery mechanism, and that is where Intune comes in. So even if you are paying for a corporate license for Chocolatey for your organization, you have a local cache, everything's all, all there, you still need some way to force the package to install on the end user's machine, and that is where Intune comes in. Your device has already uh, got the agent there. You're using that to kick off a PowerShell script that will uh, go and install the application from Chocolatey or from Winget or whatever. So the difference between Intune and other package managers is Intune just kicks off the install for you. Yes. Whether you're going to use another package manager or not, that's completely up to you. And there's like there's no disadvantage if there are better ways. Uh, if you don't want to maintain uh, the packages and you know and you can rely on the other packages um, that you know they are going to be reliable, go for it. But you still need some kind of mechanism to deploy it out. I know yep. some people probably use GPO, but in the amazing world that we live in, we don't have domain joined machines. Yay! So we rely 100% on Intune to uh, deploy our PowerShell scripts and deploy our Win32 apps along with config policies and all that sort of shiny stuff. But that's, I just wanted to point that out, that this solution is not saying that other package managers are better or worse or not as good or whatever. All I'm simply saying is, I, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter how you install the application, you need to use Intune to, to start the, yeah, to invoke it. And that's, that's yeah. really important. And look, Ben and I have had uh, many a heated discussion around using Choco and things like that. Or with Intune as a deployment mechanism. And look, if you're using the public repos, there's no problem in doing that. Yeah. But you're also sitting there and saying, I trust that these packages are up to date. And if there is a bug with how somebody's packaged it, yeah. it's been caught before it makes it into my corporate environment. Exactly. I, I don't, I don't, okay. So I don't think there is a place in a corporate environment to be using the public chocolatey re repos. Yep. That is just, that, that shouldn't be happening. And anyone that is using chocolatey in a corporate environment will attest to that. The thing that we need to point out though, is that if you are using a third party package manager, you probably won't get all the shiny fun stuff of delivery optimization yep. where your payload exists entirely in the Intune Win application and it's managed and, and handled uh, like peer caching and that sort of stuff. So if your if your package in Intune is simply a script that goes, go to this server and pull this stuff down, you don't get delivery optimization about that. And that's a, that's a key thing uh, to, to understand as well. Yep. And look, that's that's where we started off with application deployment in Intune. Exactly. Well, actually, that was, that was step two. First one was MSI with the PowerShell script in there that went and downloaded everything. <laughs> <laughs> and then we got the PowerShell scripts and then we got Win32 and now we're having all of these extra dependencies and things like that bolted on top of Win32. Exactly. Um, there, there is a lot of advantages to using package managers. Probably one of the package managers that I'd recommend to actually look at and Ben's going to look at me and go, what do you mean, is Windows Store for Business. Yeah. It's an interactive package manager that we can go on, we've already got content up there where like Power BI desktop, you totally, do not totally. need to manually install that anymore. You do not need to maintain it. Go to the store for business, deploy it out to your customers and it's there. But the key thing, the key thing to point out there, yeah, 
yeah, but the key thing to point out is that the that package manager is natively tied into Intune. So we That's can right. select the packages from Intune to deploy out. So exactly. if we were to get, you know, somewhere down the line, DO where too. it does have DO. But like, imagine if we got to a point where you could choose your own package manager natively yep. in, in the Intune or the endpoint manager portal and say, I'm going to deploy these packages from the portal. I, I I think that would be amazing, and you know that would be awesome. Yeah, fingers crossed. If you're listening, guys, that'd be great. Exactly. Yeah, happy to have a chat about it. Um, okay, cool. let's let's so move. We've on. diverged enough. Let's move on. There's plenty of time to diverge some more. Okay, so recapping application deployment, we've literally just gone through this. Um, so we'll just we'll just go through these are kind of the pain points. Um, yep. but okay, so first things first, you need to assume that the installation package works because you haven't tested, you've just wrapped it up and you've just pushed it out, right? So you need to just initially make That's that right. assumption. And yeah, and then the flip side around this is that when, you, when you, you're when you having that conversation with a client and they, they've given you the installation media, the first thing I need to assume, hopefully, and this <laughs> is incorrect, but I, I have to assume that they know that the application already installs and all they want me to do is repackage it to deploy using Intune. Now, the reality is I have to assume that it doesn't work and then I need to review how it installs yep. and do all that sort of stuff. But for the case of, uh, for, for this, we need to assume that it just works. Yep. So then we need to create the deployment media with the Intune Win App Util CLI tool, uh, which is available on this link uh, on, the, on the screen. Um, this is just a very basic, um, Ticks, ticks a box solution that uh, encrypts your installation media and puts it in a file that we can then upload to Intune. Don't need to say anything more about it. It's maintained, um, it's constantly being updated. So make sure that you've always got the latest version. Um, but yeah, there's, there's not much to say, it just works, it's, it's great. And also go and check the readmes because occasionally the repo will change. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, they've <laughs> definitely done that on me at least once. Um, so, okay, so we've created that we've we've got the application. We know that just works. We've created the deployment media. Um, we then need to go into the endpoint portal and we need to create the application like we've just gone through. Um, so the key things to that, um, we need to define the application install, uninstall strings. We need to define so our requirements. I'm going to call it out there. Yeah. Make sure you define real uninstall strings for your applications because there's nothing worse than not being able to uninstall an application that you need to because something went wrong. Exactly. But this is also for supersedents and things like that because Intune doesn't have that fully baked in today. Yeah. There's a process where you can send an uninstall to the computer and send a new install of the new version. Exactly. So yeah, obviously uninstall if you can. If there's no native way to uninstall the application, and I've seen applications like that, you just Real need to create nice. an you just need to create another wrapper. So yep. most of the applications that I package uh, are based around the idea of a single install.ps1 wrapper that does everything for me, including logging. Um, you just need to you just need to include another uninstall, and you just basically need to yep. be able to reverse every step. Um, but yeah, it's a good good point to call out. Um, so the second thing we need to do is we need to define the requirements. So base minimum, that is setting the uh, OS architecture, which is 64-bit always, um, yep. and your minimum operating system. We can obviously get into the custom uh, PowerShell stuff that Steve was talking about, but yep. at a minimum, what we need to do is just set the OS ar architecture and the operating system minimum. Yep. We need to define the detection method to prove that the application is both not there and there. It's very uh, Schrodinger's cat, but if the application is already there, it's not going to install. And that's, that's where right. this detection method is really important because it's actually run twice. So it's run before the app installs and after. So one and of the most important parts. Yeah, I, I exactly. Can't stress that enough is detection methods is one of those products that or components that if you get it wrong, you're going to have a bad day. Exactly. Um, or bad cool. week, let's face it. So then we need to wait for the media upload. Now it's important uh, that I've put that at this point because the actual installation media doesn't upload until after you've created all of the, the metadata for your application. Yep. Now, uh, I've moved into a place with decent internet, so this is now no longer a problem for me, but before uh, it was. If I had uh, you know, multi-gig uh, applications, I was just, it, it would just take forever. I would need to go and have a very long lunch break and hope to God that my internet didn't drop out midway through uh, the upload. So it's, you know, it, it kind of sucks that that's the last thing. It should be uploading while we're at least 
filling in the metadata, but it's not, yep. and I, I do understand why. Finally, after it's uploaded and we need to wait until the media is uploaded. So again, this can take quite a lot of time. Um, we it need will to assign not let you. Yeah, it yes. will not let you do this until the files are up there. That's correct. So once it's uploaded, and once we've got a big green tick saying that it's uh, been uploaded and it's all good, we then assign it to our security groups, um, and then we set up our, you know, the the uh, whether we're going to suppress the reboots and that that sort of stuff. And then finally, we cross our fingers that it worked. Because after all of that, if we deploy it out and it fails, we have to do it all again. Um, yeah, you it's, do. Yeah, it's not fun. It's not fun at all. Okay, so what's wrong with this process, and 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 how can we how can we improve it? The key thing is that it's obviously time consuming. Yes. The media doesn't begin uploading, as I've said. Application parameters aren't historically recorded. Now, this is an important one. So. Yeah. All the metadata that you're creating, so the install strings, the uninstall strings, the requirements, detection methods, they're just a point in time. If you delete that or you change it, yep. you don't get to check what it was previously. Um, this is something where the concept of everything as code, uh, this, this really sort of brings home a major point that this needs to be as code. Your configuration of yep. how you're deploying your applications needs to be in a very simple be it JSON or YAML or whatever your poison is, it needs to be in a, a format that you can actually source control so that you can go through and see uh, who made a change so you can see who you need to hit over the head. Yes. I, I prefer to put mine into Kix, just so you know, Ben. In Kix? Oh, yeah. Kix into so, there. Yeah, cool. Yeah, yeah. it's it's yeah, it's yeah, more severe. Kix format. Yeah. Okay. You, you know what I'm talking about, K-Script, Kix script? I don't. You'll have oh, to show wow. me this later. Okay. All right. We'll, we'll talk about this after this. Um, all right. So, and then finally, assigning to security groups takes time. Now, what what I was sort of saying with this is is assigning the security group that doesn't take time, but it actually then ending up on the end user's machine or your test machine or whatever can take you know up to an hour sometimes. Technically, up to eight hours, depending on the yeah. Time. It's generally 10 to 15 minutes, but it's still if you if you just want to sort of rapidly iterate uh, through an application, it you know it takes time and it and it kind of sucks waiting for it because um, you know it can yeah sometimes it takes boring. a lot longer exactly it's boring um, and then relying on test devices to be cleaned before and after each deployment to prefer sanitize test devices now. <laughs> so what I'm saying here is that we need to rely that our test device has been cleaned. So, and, and why I laugh here is the number of times I've sat there with Ben while he's been doing testing and he's put it onto his laptop and you're like, oh, yeah, it doesn't work. Oh, oh yes. Because of my laptop. I am guilty of it. Steve is guilty of it. We're all guilty of doing this. We're all guilty of just installing the client application on our machine and, and trying to see how or whether it works or not. This is a bad idea. We should always be testing on a, a brand new Machine, virtual machine always virtual machine that is clean has nothing else on it because that is how we should be testing no drivers no nothing. nothing and and that's the important thing right if you're sitting there and starting on a base neutral configuration being a virtual machine you don't have to worry about was it because there was this lte driver on there or was it because of that you can rule out a whole heap of things straight away because it's a pure os exactly um and we will get into that, but it's one of the key things is that if it fails because it's missing something, that is a failure of the application install, and yes. that needs to be added as either a dependency or inside your install wrapper. And that's the right. sort of stuff that, like, you can't you can't rely that your machine and, it and its configuration is standard because it's that's not. Okay. It always works on my computer. It, it always exactly, and that's the problem, right? Where you know, we're we're technically we're getting close to being developers, you know, while we're talking about this sort of stuff. So, it always works for the developer, never works for the end user. So you need to you need to test your environment like it's an end user machine, and that's yeah. that's sort of what we're getting at with this presentation. Okay, so how can we improve the problems that we that we were just discussing? So, firstly, let's move the configuration of the application away from Intune to the portal and make it as code. So I discussed this last year. Um, the link to the presentation that I made last year is, is below. Um, so I, I don't need to get into too much. Suffice to say, I have a script that 
using a YAML config file allows me to have my config as code, um, and then it will upload all the content for me. So it's it's nice and easy. Um, I've actually moved it to uh, VS Code now, so I have tasks uh, natively. But this is because I now have fast internet, I can do it all. Uh, but pretty cool. Yeah, it is it's it's nice and shiny. So secondly, let's remove the components we know work. So we know they're always going to work, so we don't need to test them. Now, the components that I'm talking about here are um, uploading the uh, installation uh, content to Intune and then deploying the installation media through Intune. Once it's up there and we know it's all packaged, regardless of whether the app installs or not, we know that it's going to get onto the end user's machine. Yep. The and only it, scenario that it's not going to, it's bad internet. Right. Well, and, and well, not just that, right? So, what we're saying is, let's take that out of the equation because you don't own that whole platform. So, if there's a service uh, degradation, you don't have that causing an issue with your testing. Exactly. Exactly. So, basically, it's out of our control. We're fairly reliant, or we're fairly confident that it's reliable. So, let's just take that out of our test environment. We need to test what we have created. That's so right. we're going to move, we're going to get rid of the delivery mechanism function of Intune, and we're just going to test creating the application and installing and detecting the application because they're, yep. the, they're the three things that are within the realm of our control. Exactly. So lastly, and we've said this before, and we're going to keep talking about this, let's keep our test environment sanitized by building and tearing down a new virtual machine each time we need to do a test. Yep. The benefit of this is obviously, as we've said, every single time the machine is provisioned, it is brand new. There's nothing behind uh, to cause uh, dependency issues or to just look, to crud up our test. Um, exactly. And that's where the idea of a spot VM comes into play because it's cheap to do this. Um, there's there's no overhead um i can't show that right now so we're not going to um and for for clarity i've already got a virtual machine provisioned um that is shiny and new uh i haven't got anything on there except for some pre-config stuff that i've actually made as part of my template um but for all intents and purpose it's a brand new machine okay so now it's demo time happy days so what we're going to do is we're just going to go through and we're going to package an application um, in this uh, DevOps pipeline magical way um, and we'll push it out. And while it's going out, we'll have a look at the actual pipeline to sort of see what's happening and how we're doing it. And also talk about some of the pain points that I had uh, over the last couple of days trying to get this thing to work um, because yes. I came up with this idea last year drinking beers in the hotel um with with a couple of with a couple of great guys um and it's taken up until three days ago for me to actually uh get off my ass and actually get this thing working so there's been some problems there's been some setbacks and steve is well aware of them okay so let's get rid of uh my favorite thing here and let's go into vs code that's great background there ben. isn't it just yeah. Looks pretty good on my T-shirt as well. Yeah, I think so. so. Okay, cool. So, all right. So we've got our repository here. Um, I'll just really quickly go through uh, what we've got. So there's not actually a lot. We've got a folder called applications with some apps that we want to package. Um, we've got our amazing info, which is like a 200 meg application. We're not going to use that for the presentation because it takes a while to uh -huh. upload. Um, and we have a very small application. I don't even know what it is. It's like two meg whatever, we'll just install that, we'll use that. Um, we have some pipelines, this is a demo one, this is not uh, what we're using, Azure pipelines. Um, and then we have our tasks. So these are basically all just the helper tasks and helper code that we use to actually do it. It's quite a lot here, um, I'm not gonna lie. Um, the build functions, are, you know, 200 lines of code, but it's it's basically just helps, helps me from, uh, helps me to get everything all packaged up um, and I just, I've lifted this from previous things that I've built. This is all available on my GitHub. Um, it's not doing a lot. It's just it's actually just programmatically hitting that uh, Intune WinApp util um, to to package up the media and then and then to put it where it needs to go. Because yep. uh, that in there has the Git MSI codes there as well. Uh, uh, yes, it does. Yeah, which so makes sure makes everybody's life easier. It does. Steve wrote this. It's great. Uh, we're not using it in this demo, but this is because yeah. I lifted and I lifted and shifted this from. Uh, the other thing that I had, so this is the, 
functionally the same code that I use for my VS Code task deployment stuff. Um, slightly tweaked so that it's non-interactive, but it's it's pretty good. Um, we've got our build script, which is just a wrapper to, uh, to kick off the functions in the build functions. Um, it's not much here. We're literally, what we're doing is we're checking um, the uh, the Git logs to make sure that we're only uh, going to kick off the build where something in the applications folder is changed. So my my actual pipeline will only trigger if there was a change in the applications folder, but I also only want to make a change or kick off the build on the application that had a change. So let's move forward, say, you know, a couple of months, this repository's got 20, 30 applications. I make one change to one application. I don't want every single app to repackage and 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 test. So what this this one line will do is it's going to look for only the uh, the applications that had a change, and those are the ones that are going to be packaged up and tested. So that allows me to not just because uh, I like last year I had a to build and done folder, and I was actually changing it at the end, and it was uh it was a bit yeah it was messy. This is much better. It was clunky. It was clunky, yeah. It was clunky, but it worked. This is much better. Um, yeah, so you know, we're just we're just going through. We're just looking for those applications. We're kicking off the build. Um, you know, invoke app build. That's it. This is this is the code that does everything. Um, get config. We're just converting it to JSON so that we can do it on our test machine. We don't have to do that, but uh, I don't know. It's a decision I made at five a.m. on a Sunday morning, so it's it's great. Um, Okay, so let's just go in and we'll make a change to Time Snapper, uh, and then we'll go into our build pipeline, watch it kick off, um, and then we can go through the actual pipeline code and talk about uh, some of that sort of stuff. Um, so Time Snapper is a fairly simple app. Um, it is an executable, not an MSI. So there's where the immediate complexity comes in. How do you make it silent? That sort of stuff. Um, we've got our app.yaml file, which is uh, my unique config file that I'm using to programmatically upload and control my applications. So this is where I was sort of going on about the as code mentality. Um, all of these fields are exactly the same fields that you would see if you went in and manually configured the application. So we've got things like app name, publisher, description. Um, these two are unique. This is actually where I'm storing the uh, the media for the application because I'm not putting the binaries in my GitHub repo because I don't need to. I don't need to track those. Um, my install file, my install command line, and my uninstall command line, which, as Steve just pointed out, is bad. This is a bad idea. We should be yes. putting in the correct uninstall string. However, for this demo, it's not important. Um, our requirements, we've got runners 32, set as false, so it should only do 64, although there is a bug with this. Um, I've got to fix up the API. Um, and then the minimum operating system architecture, I've got it set as 1809. Finally, we've got a detection. Um, so in here, we've got detection type as file. Um, we've got three options, obviously, file, registry, or MSI. Um, so in this scenario, we're just looking to see that timesnapper.exe exists in program files x86. Um, if we wanted to do registry, we just put in full string, including so you go to regedit and just copy the path uh, in the in the location, um, put that in. It's exactly the same as the file detection. And MSI is just based on the install GUID uh, that, that comes from an MSI package. It's all fairly simple. Um, yep. So the benefit of this, obviously, as we were saying, um, is that because I've now got this as code in my repository, if I were to change something, like let's say I get rid of an E from the name. Um, that's now historically tracked, so I can go back and I can see when that change was made, who made it, and go and tap them on the shoulder and ask why it was done without approval or you well, know, no. or just whatever. So, so Ben, if the, if the change was made, the git commit information should be detailed enough to explain why that change was made. There should be a change request number. There should be a process exactly. in place so you don't have to go and ask and go, oh, okay, cool. Sure. It's not about kicking heads in. It's just more about having the ability to see all the changes in your environment. I completely and understand why it's happened. That's right. Okay. So we've made the change uh, to the application very small. We don't need to do anything else. I just made a change for the sake of being able to publish the code back into our repository. Um, so we're just going to go in here. We're going to go uh, fixed name of application. And we're going to push that up. Now let's go over to this one. So this is in my uh, DevOps environment. 
It's very exciting. There's no readmes. We're going to go into pipelines, and we can see immediately that we've got our uh, commit message uh, or our, our commit code, uh, yeah. and we've got the name uh, of or, you know the the message that I've put in, um, and it's and, kicked and off six seconds. How many and you can see how many times Ben's run this for practice. Sure, you can. You want to see this today? It's <laughs> failed a lot, and I mean a lot. There's there's been there's been some problems with this thing, man. Um, it's only passed twenty five percent of the time. I think was the stat I saw earlier. Yeah, in the last fourteen days, it's a nightmare. So let's just drill into this, and then we'll we'll look at the configuration. Thank you, Steve. Thanks for pointing that out. That's fantastic. You're more than welcome, Ben. That's what I'm here for. Yeah, excellent. To, have a bit of fun with you. Of course. Um, okay, so we can see here um, that we've got our uh, our build is kicking off, and it's actually like halfway through. It's it, obviously the application is quite small, so this should be very quick. Um, but what we're doing, and this is important, we can talk about this, is I'm actually doing all of the work with the virtual machine using nothing but SSH and PowerShell 7. Um, so I'm doing a, a new PS session with SSH as the protocol. Um, incredible once I got it to work. Um, <laughs> basically, your two options to uh, talk or do work programmatically with a virtual machine in Azure um, are SSH with PowerShell 7 or WinRM. I have never been able to get WinRM to work. For, for one, or one reason or the other, specifically one reason, in that the device is sitting in Azure, WinRM is inherently designed to be uh, to allow devices on its uh, LAN or its local network to have access. If you need to do external, it needs to be HTTPS and it needs to have a properly signed certificate that is not self-signed. Now, the problem is, is that even if you go into Azure, you set up your VM and you go in and say, enable WinRM, the first thing it does is it creates a self-signed certificate which doesn't work. I'd like to be proved wrong. <laughs> but and we now, failed. We, yeah, we did, we did fail. We did. Kind of expected that to happen. Um, but let's, let's, okay, so let's go through what's going on and let's analyze why it failed. Okay, so first things first, we're grabbing the SSH key. So this is just the identity key that we need to use uh, to authenticate into the machine. SSH is a relatively new concept in the Windows world. It's very, very old everywhere else. So if you don't know how to authenticate with SSH, um, we can, you know. Google. Yeah, just Google it. There's, there's plenty of things. I'll probably put up a blog about it. We might even do a video about it later. I think it's, I think it's important at this point um, that the people that use Windows uh, need to understand how it works because it's, it's good and it works really well. Um, Next one, we're grabbing the public IP well, of the virtual the next machine. Next one is we're checking out the code. Yeah, it's actually interesting that that came up there. Um, that's because what I'm doing is I'm actually downloading a secret file. So I've got my identity file, which has got the the code that basically says I am me, uh, uh -huh. and I'm storing that in a secure file. So it's in super encrypted, and you it doesn't go anywhere else, and you can't download it or anything like that. Um, so the first step is actually just pulling that down and, and I'll show, I can show you how that's done. Um, so yeah, then we're checking out the repository. We're grabbing the public IP of the virtual machine because obviously this is dynamic and this is an important one as well, um, that we can talk about in a second, but I'm grabbing that because I need that for later. Um, I'm then configuring that SSH key because I need to strip out all the permissions on that file. Um, because SSH will only allow you to use an identity file if there are no other permissions on it. So I can be the only one that has access to this file. And by default in Windows, if you create a file, you, authenticated users, administrators, and system have access to it. And when you try to authenticate with that file, it immediately goes, this is not secure. You need to get rid of these things. So what we're doing is we're essentially stripping out the content of that file and then just pumping it straight into SSH. Nice. We're then preparing the environment. There's not that much that's done here. We're just installing a couple of modules. So installing PowerShell YAML and installing Azure AD. I probably don't even need to do Azure AD at this point. I'm pretty sure that comes by default on the uh, on the, uh, the the environment that I'm using, um, but I just used it as just as a safety mechanism. Um, I'm also just confirming when I was doing this that I was actually using seven because I wasn't sure, um, but sure enough I am and that's great. 
Um, build time is we're, we're doing the build. We've got the fancy graphic That's to show true. that we're, yeah, we're kicking off the build. Um, we can see that we found one application to update and that is applications time snapper. We're getting all this information from that Git log line. Um, so, you know, that's that's really cool. I'm really, really happy that I figured that one out. Um, we're then downloading the media um, that was in the YAML file. Um, we're putting it into the to the uh, folder, unpacking it, creating the installation media, just using that inch in win util uh, executable. And that's that's all that happens at this point. We're then zipping up that folder because we need a single folder. We can't do recursive copy, um, very much like uh, uh, AZ copy. You need, it needs to be a single file. Yeah, that um, makes sense. It does, it does. So we're, we're archiving this is in a very similar way that we would do for like an artifact. Um, and one more step that I will put into this build pipeline is that I will, I will create an artifact that we can then historically go back and, you know, sort of get that information. Uh -huh. <clears throat> and then the thing that failed, remote build time. Okay, error so one. error code one. So unfortunately, there's not a lot of information with this, and we'll explain uh, a little bit about what's going on there, but you can see it's failed three times across four pipeline runs in the last 14 days. This is the bane of my existence. I will get there. Um, so, okay, the first thing we're doing is where uh, we're actually connecting into the machine. So we're going in and we're typing in a command, which is... S new peer session hostname app test IP address SSH transport. What this is doing is it's creating a new session uh, on my machine, or in in this case on the host device or the the host container. Um, target device. The tar No, no, not the target device. It's creating connection on the host container to connect into the target device. So if I oh, run okay. this on, yep. yeah. So if I run this on this machine now, actually, there's another flag that gets done on the build that we don't need to do on my machine, but this is key file path. So in the step where it says configure SSH keys, what I'm actually doing uh, in this line is I'm just saying this is the location of the key file path, so my identity. Um, so don't go and try and look for it in my profile because this is who I want to log in as. Um, yep. But in this scenario, I've already got the key file stuff all configured on my machine, so I can just do this. Cool. And it shouldn't take too long. Hopefully, the machine is still up. Oh, that was me pressing up. Uh, we'll have a look at S, and we can see that I've I've connected here. Um, and what I can do is I can then enter PS session S, and I'm on the machine. Yep. So notice that there were no passwords. All I was doing was saying that this is the user of the account that I want to connect to. This is the host name of the machine that I want to connect to. All the password handling gets handled by SSH. Um, nice. So it's a really, really good way of doing this sort of stuff. So, okay, we've made a connection. Um, we've we've made that uh, new peer session. And the key thing here is that we're not entering the session. What we're then doing is we're invoking the peer session or invoking command and then sending command uh, script blocks through to that, yep. right? Because Which if you awesome. enter... So it's like PS remote, uh, PS, PS remote direct, PS direct. PowerShell Direct. Exactly like PowerShell Direct. Exactly. Yeah, no, exactly. It's it's the same thing. Um, okay, so we're connecting into the machine. We're moving the the, artif uh, the artifact file that we created into the computer, uh, into a pre-staged folder that I've that I've created as part of my template. Uh, we're unpacking it and then we're kicking off uh, we're kicking off the install using PS exec. Now I needed to use PS exec because there is a great module that uh, that you can actually use to invoke as system. Uh, I think it's invoke command as. The problem is is that uh, the scheduled task modules don't work in PowerShell seven, <laughs> so I can't use that. So I still need to rely on PS exec to elevate myself to system. And the reason I'm elevating myself to system is to replicate the experience of installing the application in Intune because by default we're saying we want to install this app as system so we need to test it as system because you know I've I've lost count of the time where I've I've tested something and I've gone yeah no it worked but it, it was using the wrong context so you know the important thing is that it needs to run a system so what you're that's, saying Ben is context is very important context is super important and that's kind of where this is failing so this error code 1 PS exec is kicking off it's it's in, it's kicking off and it's running this invoke.installation file, which is just a wrapper that I've used uh, that is on in the repository that goes show me all the files that you've just uh, that you've put into that drop.zip file. 
iterate through each one and find the ones that are applications. So, because you can actually deploy multiple applications to this and test. Um, any application that's got a .intune win file in that folder, we're going to call that an application. And then we're going to step through each one of those and we're going to install each one. There's obviously a problem somewhere um, with either the invoke installation or the executable that we're trying to install because it's bombing out with a non-standard or a non-zero error code. Um, and unfortunately, all we get is it exited with one. So instead of this being the end of the world and me on the ground crying and giving up on life. Like you have been for the last three days. Yeah, like, yeah, for the last cut, yeah, it's, it's, it's been a time. What we can do is we can go, okay, so let's let's analyze and try and find out what actually happened. So the first thing I want to do is I just want to remote into the machine uh, using command line because it's cool and we're all, you know, we want to do the cool things. So I'm already on the machine. So let's just go into uh, bin, which is where I uh, dumped that content. And we'll just have a look here. Uh, we can obviously already see that we've got this stuff because I'm doing a, a, a get child item or a list or what was that amazing one that you used the other day? No, to, no, no, it was SL for set SL. location. Yes. No, 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 it wasn't set. No, you showed me something else. Because instead of doing like um, uh, DIR or LS, you did some other. No, it was, it was LS. Set location? SL. Okay. Which was right. the CD in, in place of sure. change directory. Okay. It's okay. set location. Anyway, let's, yeah, okay. So <laughs> we're already doing a get child <laughs> item. We're doing it. Yeah, that sort of thing. So we already know that content's there. That's cool. Let's just step into the time snapper folder. Um, and we'll just have a look at what's in here. So in here, we've got um, app JSON and time win. This folder is actually the uh, expanded or decrypted win file. In my repository, again, that I'm going to make available on GitHub, I've actually reverse engineered the, uh, the, the CLI tool to figure out how it is unencrypting the files and I'm unencrypting them in PowerShell so that we can then do this. Because if we go in here and we go to Intune package, we have the unencrypted media. So everything that was in this, minus the uh, encryption keys and all that sort of stuff, because we don't need to hand those out during a demo. <laughs> um, we have our binary folder um, that if we go in, oh, that's, yeah, that's going to work. Uh, we can actually see it's it's grabbed time snapper pro setup dot exe from our uh, our storage account and it's put it in that location. We've got the app dot yaml and the install dot one ps uh, dot ps one. So all the installation media is where it needs to be. Everything's all happy days, uh, but for whatever reason it's failed, right? So let's let's have a look here. Uh, one more. Okay, so the one thing that is different on this as opposed to this one, is this file detection result. So we do get content detection result. And it's going to be awesome. Detection result is true. Good work. Ben. So my detection method has actually ran, and it's found that the application is installed on this machine. So what you're saying <laughs> is this awesome is this application is awesome. That's and correct. It's not handling exit codes and installations correctly. Yeah, something something real funky is happening with this application where it is exiting with its non-standard thing that is making PS exec fail. This is why you don't decide to change the application you're going to deploy in a demo 15 minutes before you're going to do the demo. Anyway, so, so we can see here the detection <laughs> result is true. What eventually the pipeline will do is it'll actually grab that and then it will use that as its pass or fail uh, mechanism, right? So it's going to go, oh, I can see that that was a false, so it's going to drop out. What's then going to happen is if it fails, um, we'll get a notification either via email or whatever saying that there was a problem with the application. It's going to keep the virtual machine open and then you can connect into it however you want and then just go and verify whether it passed or failed yourself. So then just to draw further onto this stream, mm -hmm. if it comes back with true, can you get it to the point where it will then send a message saying, it's passed all of the tests. Do you want me to deploy it to Intune? Yes, that is the next stage. So, and and this should be, um, it's a really good segue to talk about how. So, multi-stage pipelines were the shiny, amazing new thing last year. It's now the standard. Everyone's writing their pipelines, hopefully, in YAML. 
Um, but the one, the one holdout was that release pipelines didn't work nicely in YAML. That's now changed. Release pipelines, including all of the shininess, including gated approvals and all that sort of stuff, now exist in the same context. So we can now do end-to-end -end CICD as code. So oh. yes, that's awesome. So for this demo, no, I'm not doing that, but yes, that would be what happens. So once it passes all these checks, what it would then do is it would send out an email to you know key stakeholders and just say, hey, the application package seems like it's installed correctly in our test machine. Uh, you know, do you want to go ahead with publishing? And then you say yes. What would then happen is it would immediately tear down that virtual machine because we don't need it to be sitting there spinning cycles for nothing. Um, and then it would just go on its merry way. We'd push it out to Intune, happy days, and hopefully everything works from there. Um, cool. It just increases the confidence that the application is going to install the first time. Definitely. Don't um, worry about the third time though. Yeah, no, the third time's overrated. Um, but okay, so I just want to, because this is funny, this application's a nightmare. I've actually remoted into the machine um, just to, just to have a look as well. Um, so we can obviously see the bin folder uh, that we've we've got this sort of stuff. But I just wanted to go in. So the detection method was based on the uh, file location, which was uh, program files x86 time snapper. So we can see that it's actually installed. So I, you know, I really want to dig in and try and identify where uh, that error code is coming from because. It's very much installed. All, all I can tell you, Ben, is I see the uninstalled file down the bottom. Is what we should be using for our... No, what I was going to say is that it's using a, a not a great application packaging engine, and yeah. that may well be causing the issue that we're yeah, facing. Yeah, hundred percent. Um, but you know, realistically, the thing is, is that most applications are uh, uh, it's rolling the dice on whether they're going to be packaged well or not. So that's yes. why that really, really um, sort of sings out my point that like we need to we need to remove away this idea that all applications are packaged the same. They're not. Most of them are terrible. It's our job to take the terrible, wrap it in some kind of way that we can handle the complexity of it, and then be able to just verify that it installs and then move on. So that's right. that's what the pipeline's going to do. Um, let me let me close out of this. Uh, I'll quickly go through what the pipeline looks like, uh, and then I guess we'll wrap up because we've yeah. probably been talking for a really long time. Um, yeah, been a while. Ish. Um, okay. So let's cool. let's go quickly in here. Um, it's actually quite a simple uh, pipeline. Um, I could talk for hours on the SSH stuff, but I will leave not that for the Q and A. I think sessions about. It's not, no. Okay, so my trigger is based on uh, anything that goes into the master uh, branch, yep. um, but only if it is in this applications folder. So any changes I make to the config or to the pipeline or to any of that sort of stuff, it's not going to kick off this pipeline. I've um, got a couple of variable names just so that I can connect into my virtual machine without having hard-coded variables. Um, I then got my stage. So again, this is a multi-stage pipeline, but I'm actually only doing one stage, so it's kind of superfluous, but that's, that's fine. Um, the the job, so you can have multiple jobs inside a single stage, where again, we're only doing one job here. Um, it is called build and test. We're spinning up a Visual Studio 2017 Windows 2016 server image as our, as our um, build environment. I am grabbing the public IP address. Um, so this is what's interesting. So see this this thing here, grabbing the SSH keys, this yep. download secure file, this happened before this one. So I've got a feeling that I don't even need this task in here because I think having the secure file just tied to the, the yep. build pipeline immediately downloads that. So anyway, that's that's cool. Um, so the, yeah, exactly. So uh, grabbing public IP is pretty simple. We're just getting the Azure VM. We're just digging through that using um, Azure PowerShell uh, commands. Um, yep. getting that information, and then we're just setting the variable to PIP. Um, this is how you set a variable. It's not very intuitive, um, but no. there's a lot of documentation on how to do it. So it's yes. all we're doing is going task set variable, the variable is PIP, and the value is this. That's going to persist cool. in this uh, job state or in this entire stage. Sure. Exactly. Uh, no, just in this stage. So if I set up another okay. stage, it's not oh, going to okay, pass yep. on. That, that so you can sense. set global or local, that sort of stuff, but yep. yeah, whatever. Um, okay, so then we're configuring the SSH keys. So I'm just, again, confirming the IP address has come through. Um, I'm then getting the contents of that secure file. 
Um, so this is all we actually see of the secure file at this stage. We're going SSH ID secure file. I'm getting the content is raw and I'm outputting it to uh, just to a location um, so that I'm stripping out all the permissions and that sort of stuff in case I forgot to do that before. Um, I'm then setting up my SSH environment. This is an important one uh, because I'm then going through uh, here. SSH key scan PIP. What I'm actually doing is I am getting the uh, the confirmation key or like the signature of the server beforehand. So if I'm on a brand new machine and I SSH to a server that I've never SSH to before, the first thing it does is it goes, hey, you've never connected to this before. Are you sure that you know this all matches and you want to go ahead? And that's an interactive thing. So what I'm doing here is I'm just going, I inherently trust this IP address is mapped to the device I want to connect to. What it does is it leaves me prone to a potential man in the middle issue, but I trust that the IP address that I've captured is going to be accurate. So I'm just going to move ahead and just get past it. So and I'm storing- At the end of the stage, those poles don't exist. So these are exactly. irrelevant. Exactly, exactly. So that, that's just doing that's it the important thing to call out, right? Yeah. Um, is so that this is point in time, very small window, especially if you're using spot VMs. The only time that will exist beyond what you're using it for in this scenario is if you need to leave the VM running. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> so what we're doing, we're just storing this data into a, a file called known host. And again, that's in that .ssh thing. So in your user profile, like this is just, when you use SSH, it's looking at files in here. So this is why this location is super important. And if you've got uh, PowerShell 7 installed on your machine, you've already got the .ssh folder in your profile. Um, cool, so we're setting that up. We're just, again, just confirming that everything looks, this is just debug stuff. Um, and then finally, we're preparing the environment. So we're initializing, installing those uh, modules that we were talking about. We're doing the build. Um, again, this is just kicking off a single file. So build.ps1, all the logic is in there. We're then archiving, so just zipping up everything that goes into the staging directory and storing it as drop.zip. And then we're doing our remote build time, which is the thing that failed. So what we're yeah, so what we're doing here is we're just doing the new PS session. Host name is the username and then the IP address. We're using SSH as our transport mechanism, and our key file path is in agent temp directory SSH ID. So this is the one that we created earlier. Um, we're then doing an SCP command, which I was actually really impressed that we now natively have SCP as a transfer mechanism. Um, I, I, I'm a Linux SCP. person. SCP is secure copy protocol. It's uh -huh. SCP is just SSH file transfer. Okay. Um, it's really good. It, it always works. Um, there's, there's a GUI version of it called Win SCP. Um, uh -huh that yeah, I've, I've used for years. So it's really cool to see that we've now natively got SCP out of the box when we install uh, Windows uh, PowerShell 7 rather. I was gonna say Windows 7. Um, <laughs> so that, that, that's a bit of a flashback. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So we're not actually using the PS session. go back session. to PowerShell 1 though too. Oh, hell yeah. Um, so we're not actually using the session that we created up here where we're doing this all natively. So we're going SCP, we're identifying the uh, the identity file that we want to use. Um, this is the file that we want to copy over. And then we're logging in. So app test IP address and then colon and then the path that we want to dump the content to. This is pretty simple, um, but the, the, the sort of context and how to type it out can be a little tricky. Cool, so once it's copied, all good. So now we're gonna unpack the artifact. So the rest of these are just script blocks that we're gonna do invoke commands. So this is a real simple one. We're gonna go expand archive. I know that the file is there because I'm copying it up here. Steve will tell you that hard-coded uh, values are bad. So will I. They are very bad. Very tired, so I just wanna get this to work. So, okay, <laughs> so we're just doing expand archive. Um, what you should be doing is putting these as variables in your environment so that everything can be expanded out and you can change this for different environments, but let's just use that. Um, cool, so we're then just invoking this command or this script block into our session that we created earlier. Um, and it works, it's all great. Um, we're doing a, a get child item just to confirm that it expands it out so that in our build environment, we can just see that it worked. Um, and then the thing that failed is uh, our, our PS exec that I pre-installed on my test environment that is part of my image uh, that I'm actually installing through Chocolatey. So again, Chocolatey is awesome. 
um, we're using PS exec. We're accepting the EULA to get past that initial uh, pop that happens. Um, we're initiate, initiating the PS exec uh, environment as system. We're then just kicking off PowerShell, setting the execution policy to bypass, and then running this file. So this file, again, is just a wrapper that just goes and looks at any application that is in that drop.zip file, and then just runs the install. That's it. So the next steps, obviously, to get that detection method uh, file that gets created and just confirm whether it was true or false. Um, the one thing I need to get around is, is it just PS exec that's causing that error code one, or is it the application that's installed? Or, you know, there's a couple of things that we need to iron out, but as, as far as a framework, this is fairly rock solid. Um, and we can start using this to um, like the first, so the way I envisage this solution being used is the first thing you do when the client gives you uh, the, the, the application media, you just stand up your basic install string or your install wrapper, some real basic detection methods and you yeah. just put it out and just see if it works so so in that concept then ben what you could do is send the standard um or the the well-known um silent strings to all of the binaries in an automated fashion and see which one succeeds. see which one succeeds yeah you could you'd need to and handle you need to handle the uh the error like, so, you know, you'd need to put everything into a try catch block so that if it bombed out, it didn't bomb out of the code that was running. Yep. Um, but yeah, you could you could basically do like a, a brute force install attempt and find out which one works. That's actually a really good idea. You're welcome. Yeah, cool. I will, uh, I'll work on that. Um, <laughs> but yeah, okay. So, I, I mean, that's kind of it. Um, awesome. Let so me let's bring go up, back to the PowerPoints. Yeah, that's, that's exactly what I'm going to do. Uh, if I've we'll still got it open. Right yeah, cool, let's do it. F5. Oh, no. Uh, hang on. I clicked it. Yeah, it's too late. I'm just going to do this. We're all very tired. Okay. Yes, we are. We are. Okay. So, okay, so the summary. So as we've said, never assume that the application media that the client has provided you is easy to install. It's probably easy, but or on the side of it's going to be complex, so let's let's work on that. So that's yeah. when, I when I talk about that, I'm talking about install wrappers and things like that. I always use an install wrapper. I always make my own logging. I always assume that the application is going to fail, regardless of how easy it is. It's just really uh, it's a really fundamental way of how I package apps and how I can be successful with them. Um, the other thing to call there is if the installer has a native log. Capture that as well, put mm -hmm. that into the same path. Completely, the yeah. More information you give your support team to be able to read and understand what's going on in, with the installation, the less you should be involved. Exactly. That's, that's yeah, that's the point of logging, right? Um, okay, so finally, or finally, secondly, uh, <laughs> sanitize testing environments, increase our trust in test results. So again, this just goes to that idea that if it, if it installs on my machine, I will not use that as a as a basis to prove that it installs everywhere. But if it installs on a machine that's just been stood up with nothing else on it, uh, then yeah, I, I'm pretty confident that it's going to install on our client machines. Yep. Um, similarly, on that note, functional testing like this increases positive client response to UAT. Now, <laughs> this is really important because when yes. you say when you talk to the client and you say, "Hey, we're going to be doing UAT testing." most of the time they're going to just nod their head and go, yeah, sure. Does that just mean cool. you're going to install the application on my computer? No, it doesn't. User acceptance testing should fail. It should get to the point where they provide feedback to you and tell you yes. why it didn't work and how you can improve it. What I mean by this increases the positive client response, it means that you're not going to get failures because you don't know how to install the application. So let's let's face can, it like... That the biggest pain point that most app packages have is I expected it to have X configuration included. Exactly. And that's the user acceptance one. And look, whether we call it UAT or whether we call it BVT, mm. they could be used interchangeably here. And this is where you're sitting there and saying, we're validating that the business processes have been met that if I was to deploy this application today to your computer, IT does not need to be involved in doing anything else. 
Exactly. And you know how to use the application and you can start working immediately. That's right. So yeah, I mean, I, I think the best example of this is um, you don't want to deploy an application that relies on .NET 3.5. You forgot to put it in and you think you're good to send it to UAT. Yep. So like this is what this sort of scenario saves you from uh, running into. And this is kind of what it was developed for. The small yeah. little niggly things like that, that, you know, we just need to be able to sort of verify before we send it to the client. Exactly. And that, I mean, I've just echoed that point. So UAT should not be about verifying application use. Um, or sorry, it should be about verif verifying application use, not whether it installs or not. It's the usability of the application. We're doing the functional black box testing. We need to make sure that it goes on the machine. User acceptance testing is them opening it, clicking buttons, making sure it works. So this is, again, what this solution gets us to. And then finally, using DevOps is fun. Um, it genuinely is. Building these pipelines is really easy. Um, I, getting How many hours the, have you spent? Yeah, but there was SSH. I'm not, I'm not going to get into that. <laughs> I wholly recommend that you go out and play with it now. Um, if you you spend code because now he's gone through all the pain of building it. Yeah, exactly. Giving it to you for free. I'm going to put it up on GitHub. You guys make it better and then share it with me so that I can see what I did wrong. Um, that's really all I want in life, you know? I just want to be yep. shown that I'm wrong. Okay. Often. Slides and demo codes. Um, everything's going to be available on github.com, psconf for you. Run this command in PowerShell. It's going to pull some content back. It's going to be very exciting. Um, yeah, cool. Um, about me and Steve, so I work at Vigilant IT. Um, I Twitter at uh, powers underscore hell. My GitHub is tabs dash not dash spaces because someone's got tabs not spaces without the dashes. Um, and I blog <laughs> at powers dash hell.com. Um, and Steve? I work at Microsoft. Yeah, you do. Uh, and you can find me at uh, on at on prem cloud guy uh, on the Twitters. Awesome. Um, cool. And, and obviously, yeah. yeah. Get all your Intune related training from Intune.training. This is a self uh, serving little uh, plug. Shameless Steve, little plug. Exactly. Steve, myself, and Adam, uh, a, a good good friend of ours uh, based out of Texas, uh, run a little training thing on Intune where we uh, weekly uh, release videos just showing some of the more standard things and the weirder things, um, sort of everything to do with Intune. Um, so if you're new to it, Go and check it out. Um, I think I think okay. it's uh, yeah, it's cool. Bit of fun. Um, cool. And obviously next year, next year apparently, um, we're all going to be over in Germany, including you, Steve. Okay. Um, yeah, exactly. So PowerShell Conference Europe 2021 has already been flagged. Um, Hanover, Germany again, June 1st to 4th. Um, I will definitely be signing up. Um, I, I just honestly, this conference is one of the best conferences I've ever been to. Um, if, yeah, just I, I hope to see everyone in person next year. That's the goal. Cool. End of slide. End of slideshow. Click continue. Okay. Thanks, guys. Uh, Thank that's you. it. We're going to wrap this up really messily. And we're very good at it.